Hello, AUCL here. In this video, we're not going to be going over any form of tutorial, but instead we're going to be revisiting old material to hopefully clarify anything that might be confusing for you. So first, let's hop into an ASCII table. And what this is, is it shows how uh, values that are numbers get converted to characters. So first we can look up at the headers up here. So we have decimal, hex, oct, html, and character. We can ignore oct and html and focus instead on decimal and hex and care. So first thing to notice is the 65 here. That represents A. So if we go in here and type 65 and convert it to hex, we get 41. That's all that this is. The conversion from decimal to hex and the character that that number represents and it's the same for all these others. Uh, 4D represents M and so on and note that the lowercase are different than the uppercase. 97 represents A. Um, I'm sorry, 97 in decimal, 61 in hex and then you get things like 6A representing J and so on. The only ones that may be confusing are perhaps these right here. You have 48 in decimal or 30 in hex representing 0 and you might be asking okay why doesn't 0 represent 0 and the reason for that is uh, it should be kind of intuitive once you see how text works if I were to write something like this this isn't a number this is this is all one string of text which means that this s is represented by some sort of character 73 the a was represented by um, another another hex value, this one is 61 and so on, and 6 has to be represented by something also, and the reason we didn't pick, or the reason that 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on aren't encoding the characters uh, 0 to 9 is because we we wanted 0 to be null, which is a reasonable thing. We wanted 0 to be nothing, but we didn't want it to be the character 0, because that would have caused some complications. So instead we threw zero here and that would have screwed up the numbers for the rest of the thing, so we just didn't make the numbers match up to the decimal values. Plain and simple. Just It's just something to remember. Zero the character is not zero the number. One the character is not, and so on and so forth. And that's pretty much it for the ASCII table. It's fairly intuitive. If you ever need to look anything up, just Google ASCII table. I'll probably put a a link to this one in the description. It's on some website. Um, very useful. Definitely worth having around. Okay, so the next probably one of the most important things to know is how do you select a method for hex editing? and I made a flowchart that I think describes the process pretty well and the first thing is does the file save relevant strings at a low count and what I mean by this is can you find your string if there is one so if you can search gold and find gold there is no reason you shouldn't it's fast easy there's no reason to do something more advanced if you don't have to but let's say we don't so we go down the no path and we know at this point that we cannot use strings. Um, is the file size small? And are you searching for a value that is infrequent or spans several bytes? It's a little wordy, but basically, if you're searching for 7f and there aren't, there's only one 7f, that's probably your value, and a value search will suffice. Or, if you have a value that's crazy, like 4E7912, the chances of getting three bytes like this lined up that aren't your value is pretty low, unless your file size is ridiculously large. Thus, a value size for a number that spans several bytes is probably recommended. But if that fails we know that we can't use strings and we can't directly search for values and then the next thing we want to know is can we change the target value to a new value with low byte frequency so if we have the value 0 0 as gold or 0 1 or something of that sort and let's say the value um, 
ED is not used, which is 237. If we could change our goal to ED, that would, then it would be the only one in the entire file, and thus we would be, be able to do a value search. So this is taking advantage of the statistical distribution in order to do a value search. Um, an example of when we couldn't do this would be a, a file that looked like this. Uh, this is th there's no values that show up zero times. In fact, the lowest value is probably uh, 7f, which occurs 35 times. Uh, 35 is still a lot of searches. Uh, it's not unmanageable, but there's a good chance that you could corrupt your file 34 times before finding the the value that you want to change, and that's a little tedious. And but this is this is a pretty bad case. It's generally rare to find a uh, distribution like this, but it happens. And if it fails, if you can't do that, then you have to move on to more complicated, the more complicated area down here. Okay, so at this point we know that we can't use strings, we can't search for values, and we can't use the byte distribution to our advantage. So next we want to know if there's any integrity checks, advanced integrity checks, sorry. So checksums, this is not file length checks, those are not particularly advanced. But if, if they do have these advanced checks, then the only way we could ever hack that save file is to reverse engineer the saving mechanism which is incredibly difficult, and I'll actually get into that last. So, let's say it doesn't have any integrity checks. Next, we want to know, is the save file heavily dynamic? If you remember from the game that I wrote in C Sharp, when I saved a new value of gold, the only thing that should have been different was one value, but in fact the whole entire file changed. Um, that's an example of an incredibly dynamic file. And if it is dynamic, uh, there's not actually really much that we can do. If we've already failed the statistical part, if we've already failed with strings and values, and the, vi the file is also heavily dynamic, um, there's really nothing we can do except blindly change things, but the chance of that working is so slim that you're basically just screwed. And so we kind of have to bank on it not being dynamic. And I mark this as blue because this is actually where most failures will occur. This is where uh, you'll, you'll probably get shafted the most in terms of save files is when the file is heavily dynamic. There's just nothing you can really do about that except reverse engineer. Um, so let's, let's go over here to does the game use encryption? And uh, so far we know that the file's not dynamic, um, there's no usable strings, can't search for values, so on. But if it does use encryption, we know what to do. We just do a file compare and shotgun like in the Spirit Engine 2. If it doesn't use encryption, then we can just do a simple file compare and we should find our raw value somewhere there. If either of these fail for whatever reason, back to reverse engineering. And reverse engineering is uh, not easy by any means. In fact, it's so advanced you could probably hack the game multi multiple other ways if you have the skill set required to reverse engineer. The only time you would ever want to reverse engineer the saving mechanism is if there was a particular weakness in how save files are read compared to, well, let's say you couldn't modify the memory with a memory editor or packet editor, you couldn't do anything of that sort then you might be able to fall back onto this, but honestly, I've never had to. You'll probably never have to. The situation that would warrant reverse engineering the saving mechanism is so rare, unless you were trying to perhaps write software that uh, parsed a save file and basically became a save game editor and you wanted to release this to the public, or whatever, that's the only time I could see this being a viable option for the amount of work that it has to be put in. Otherwise, you kind of have to bank on the rest of this stuff. Uh, I guess that's it for this video. I think that hopefully cleared up some of the uh, confusion that might have come with all these different methods of when to use them and what exactly uh, 
bites and characters had to do with one another. Uh, thanks for watching, and farewell.